Our scripture reading this morning comes from Revelation chapter 16, verses 1 through 21. You can find that passage and follow along in the New Testament section of your pew Bibles on page 255. Revelation 16, 1 through 21. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured his bowl on the earth, and a foul and painful sore came on those who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. The second angel poured his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, You are just, O Holy One, who are and were. For you have judged these things, because they shed the blood of saints and prophets. You have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, your judgments are true and just. The fourth angel poured his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, but they cursed the name of God, who had authority over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores and they did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up in order to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw three foul spirits like frogs coming from the mouth of the dragon, from the mouth of the beast, and from the mouth of the false prophet. These are demonic spirits, performing signs, who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle, on the great day of God the Almighty. See, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and who is clothed, not going about naked and exposed to shame. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a violent earthquake such as had not occurred since people were upon the earth. So violent was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. God remembered great Babylon and gave her the wine cup of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found, and huge hailstones each weighing about a hundred pounds, dropped from heaven upon people until they cursed God for the plague of the hail. So fearful was that plague. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, aliens decide to finally visit the Earth, and they come in peace, and surprisingly, they all speak English. So all the heads of the world governments and all the heads of the religious movements set up a meeting with our new visitors. After everyone gets their turn, and it's finally the Pope's turn, he asks our alien friends, do you know about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? The aliens get a little bit excited. They look at each other and they say, Oh, you mean good old JC. Yeah, we know him. He's the best, isn't he? He swings by our planet every year to make sure that we're doing okay. He brings us all sorts of good things. And Jesus always makes sure that we never have any earthquakes, any diseases, or any natural disasters. Surprised, the Pope says, 
He visits you every year? It's been over 2,000 years and we're still waiting for his second coming. The aliens get really quiet and one of them says, well, maybe he just likes our chocolate better than yours. Chocolate, says the Pope. What does that have to do with anything? The alien says, well, long ago, back when he first visited our planet, we welcomed him. We had a great time together while he was here. And when it was time for him to go, we gave him a huge box of chocolates. Why? What did you guys do? Today's sermon from the book of Revelation is about the wrath of God. That's something we don't like to talk about, really even think about. You see, I think most of us like to conceive of God as this heavenly Santa Claus who is always kind and jolly, who always loves us, always listens to our wishes, I mean our prayers, and always gives us everything we want. Of course, even Santa Claus has been known to drop the occasional lump of coal into a naughty stocking, but that doesn't seem too bad, all things considered, and most of us don't even know anyone that's ever happened to. But Revelation chapter 16, and several of the chapters leading up to it, paint God in a very different light than we like to imagine. We see God dishing out, pardon the pun, dishing out the bowls, yeah, okay. We see God dishing out all sorts of nasty things to the people of the earth, rivers of blood, scorching heat, darkness, sores, earthquakes, and 100 pound hailstones. Imagine that conversation with your insurance agent. This is probably a good place to remind ourselves that John's vision, the book of Revelation, is written in a very well-established literary genre called apocalyptic literature. And that kind of writing is always filled with coded imagery and symbols, with each symbol representing something that would have made perfect sense to people in the know in the original audience who understood the code. Now symbols can be interpreted in a lot of different ways, but by their very nature as symbols, the one thing a symbol cannot represent is the thing that it is. So when we call New York City the Big Apple, we may mean a lot of different things by that, but the one thing that we do not mean is that it's a giant piece of fruit sitting somewhere on the northeastern shore of the United States. That's how symbols work. They represent something different than what they are. And so all of the terrible symbols that we see in the book of Revelation are not meant to be taken literally as what they appear to be, but they are meant to be taken seriously. And behind every one of those symbols is this concept that makes us so uncomfortable, the wrath of God. I want to make the case to you today that God's wrath is not a bad thing. In fact, I think it's a very good and necessary thing. A couple of examples. My wife, Amy, is one of the most kind and loving people that you could ever meet. But if anyone or anything ever threatens one of our three children, look out! A mother's wrath is a powerful force, one to be reckoned with. And I think most of us would agree it's usually a benevolent force as well. So too with God's wrath. In the same way, when we turn on the television or our computers and we see horrible injustices committed in our world, 
We often long for strong leaders, leaders who have both the power and the motivation to intervene in the situation, to punish those who are responsible for bad things, to ensure that justice is done. So too with God. The problem is, we are entirely okay with righteous anger and with wrathful justice when it is directed at those people over there. You know, bad people. People who are not us. And we ourselves, of course, we are never bad, right? I think we all know the real answer to that question. In our scripture passage today, God's wrath is poured out upon humanity in seven bowls. And that's an ironic symbol right there. Because a bowl is something that usually contains food or drink. Things that are meant to nourish and sustain us, not meant to harm us. And yet in the first century world, as John was writing this, bowls were also used to administer medicine. Herbs and remedies meant to heal people who were sick. We know, even today, medicine doesn't always taste good going down. And yet, we tend to believe that the person giving us that medicine loves us and wants us to be better. So, too, it is with God, God's wrath and these bowls of God's wrath. Now, throughout the book of Revelation and pretty much the entire Bible, there are only two things capable of summoning up the wrath of God. The first is people or situations that threaten God's children. In the Old Testament, this is the people of Israel, and in the New Testament, we see this as threatens, threats to the early church or the Christians in the New Testament. And there's an example of this in today's scripture. God turns the rivers and the waters of the earth into blood. And again, I don't think this means literally blood. It's a symbol representing something else. And why does God do this? Verse 6, because they shed the blood of saints and prophets. You have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. You see, in the time when John was writing Revelation, Christians were being actively slaughtered by the Roman Empire because of their faith. And so the manifestation of God's wrath in Revelation is in part a cry for justice from John as he writes. And it is in part a promise from God that justice will prevail, that someday things will be made right. The second thing that summons God's wrath in Revelation and in all of the Bible is when people put their hope, their trust, and their allegiance in things that are not God. That's called idolatry, worshiping false idols. But it doesn't have to be a little statue. There are a lot of ways in which we can fall into the trap of idolatry. As a parent of children, this one is starting to make more and more sense to me as my children grow older. You see, I know that more than almost anyone else in this world, I love my children and I will always have their best interests at heart. But I can get really upset and really frustrated when I see them beginning to put their faith and their trust in things that I know because of my experience are false or even dangerous. Now, I want them to be able to make good decisions on their own. And so sometimes I let them make their choices. But it's also my responsibility sometimes to step in and to intervene whenever someone or something is leading them astray, leading them down a dangerous path. And when I step in and intervene, it sometimes looks like wrath to them, whether it might be a restriction or a punishment or even me just yelling at them not to do that thing. To them, it looks like wrath. 
to me, it's a manifestation of love. We see this in verse 2, when at the first bowl of God's wrath, a foul and painful sore came on those who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped its image. So people who are turning away from God to worship someone or something else. Now, there has been a lot of intrigue and speculation in the last 2,000 years on what exactly is the mark of the beast. And who is the beast? That speculation continues right up to the present day. Earlier in the book of Revelation, in chapter 13, we learned that the beast would cause everyone, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to receive a certain mark so that no one can buy or sell who does not have the mark. This is an important clue. In John's day, the Roman emperor Domitian, the first emperor to actively begin executing Christians, that same Roman emperor required by law people to address him as Dominus et Deus Noster, which is Latin for our Lord and our God. And that phrase was printed on Roman coins along with Domitian's image. So obviously Christians might have a problem with this. So Revelation is probably saying that those who participate in the cult of emperor worship, even by something as innocent as buying or selling things, with these worshipful coins, that those very people are at risk for summoning the wrath of our true Lord and God, the creator of the universe. Now the beast here is part of a demonic trio that shows up in several places in Revelation, including in verse 13 of today's passage, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Some scholars interpret these as, interpret the dragon as Satan, the beast as the Roman emperor, and the false prophet as the Roman civic structure, all the local governors and the temple priests who enforced worship of the emperor. But on another level, you could look at this unholy trio as being a symbolic perversion of the Holy Trinity, God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In verse 19, God reserves the greatest share of his wrath, the seventh and final bowl, for the great city of Babylon, which is destroyed by an earthquake and those 100-pound hailstones. The problem with this is that by the time John is writing the book of Revelation, the historic city of Babylon had already been destroyed. 500 years in the past. So here again, Babylon is a symbol. It's code. The ancient enemy of Israel acts as a stand-in for the current enemy of the early Christians, the city at the very heart of the Roman Empire, the city of Rome. If John had actually written about the destruction of the city of Rome, he would have been found guilty of treason, and executed, much in the same way that anyone today who thought it would be a good idea to publish a manifesto on Facebook about the destruction of Washington, D.C., would probably at the very least get a nice knock on their door from the FBI and a not-so-pleasant visit. One more point of interest here. Verse 14 through 16 talk about the kings of the earth assembling for a great battle at a place called Armageddon or as it is often incorrectly pronounced, Armageddon. In Hebrew, Har means mountain. But there is no mountain that we know of called Mageddon in the ancient world. There's a plain in northern Israel called Megiddo, but it's not a mountain. And that was the site of several historic battles. And so, scholars view it as a likely candidate for what John is talking about. But here again, this is symbolism, much in the same way that we might talk about the Battle of Waterloo, or the beaches of Normandy, or Gettysburg, as 
places that we all know as places of battle. It's a stand-in, then, for some undetermined place where God will ultimately defeat the Roman Empire and finally being, bring justice to his wounded, hurting children. Of course, if you're a student of history, you know that the Roman Empire did not fall in one colossal battle. That actually happened hundreds of years after John wrote the book of Revelation through many battles and through a gradual process of decline and decay. And by then, in a twist of irony, Christianity was no longer persecuted by the Roman government, but Christianity had become itself the officially recognized religion of the Roman Empire. None of that, however, stopped medieval Christians and Christians right up to the present day from speculating about when Armageddon would finally happen and when the dragon and the beast and the false prophet would appear and when the mark of the beast would be imposed and when the prophecies of Revelation would finally come to pass. Now, I've said before that I do not believe that we are in the end times today or that Revelation was ever meant to be interpreted as a prediction about the end of the world. But I do believe that the message of Revelation is just as relevant today as it was in John's time when it was written. You see, Revelation is not meant to be a crystal ball that we look in to see the future. It's meant to be a mirror that we hold up to reflect upon us our own times, but to see those things happening around us through the lens of what happened long ago, because some of the dangers are very similar. Revelation is and should be to us a constant warning in every age about what happens when we persecute and threaten God's children and when we put our trust and our allegiance in things that are not God. It would be very easy for us to say, oh, well, nobody today worships Caesar. Nobody would do something like that. And yet I think sometimes our challenges are a little bit harder to recognize as similar because we are in the midst of them. If we do not take Revelation literally, and I don't think that we should, we still must take it very Seriously, we should ask ourselves, what are the unholy trinities in our world today which threaten God's children? What are the false idols that demand that we should worship them in place of God? I have some ideas about that, although your list may be a little bit different than mine. The first thing on my list is a dragon and a new religion that we have created called science. Now hear me out on this one because I am a fan of classical science and most of the pioneers of the scientific method, people like Galileo and Descartes and Sir Isaac Newton, were devout Christians who believed that the study of the natural world would always lead us to a greater understanding of God. But today I often hear people speak of science in a way that sounds more like a belief, a philosophy, and a religious practice than anything else. I hear people put unquestioning faith and trust in science and scientists, even when they themselves have very little understanding of its basic tenets and less willingness to learn and to explore those things. We are taught often that things spoken in the name of science are beyond reproach and beyond argument, even though the historic scientific method tells us to challenge and test every hypothesis, every proof on a continual and ongoing basis. We would do well to remember that ultimately the very best science that we have available to us in this day as powerful and helpful as it can be, still consists of nothing more than observations and interpretations from fallible 
human beings, institutions, and corporations. And so if you put your first and foremost trust in science, instead of the God who created the laws of science and the universe, you will ultimately be disappointed and led astray. The second thing on my list of dangers in our present day is the beast. And it is actually the same one in our own time that it was in the first century when John was writing Revelation. It's the powers and governmental authorities of the world. Caesar is alive and well today, and he still wants to be Lord and God of your life, your choices, and your heart. Whether it's a Chinese government that imprisons Christians today for their faith, whether it is an Afghan government that martyrs them today, or whether it's an American government that sometimes silences them. Any earthly power that competes with God for your allegiance and your faith is worthy of neither. Our country, and also the Presbyterian Church itself, were founded with a healthy dose of skepticism for all worldly power and a strong preference for individual liberty and freedom of conscience. The third thing on my list is the false prophet of politics and political parties. Two years ago, if I had stood up in front of you and said, Donald Trump is the Antichrist, a force for evil who is leading our country astray, half of you would have agreed with me enthusiastically. And today, if I said the exact same thing about Joe Biden, the other half would agree enthusiastically. So that's a problem. And herein lies the truth. Our allegiance to either political party, if it becomes the driving force behind our choices, our beliefs, our worldview, our relationships, and the way we perceive other people, then it's a false idol. And it leads us away from God, not to mention away from each other. In my humble opinion, all three of these things are real and present-day threats to God's people and to our faith in God just as much as those written about by John in the first century. Of course, I just said I believe in freedom of conscience. You are free to make your own list. Verse 15 of our scripture passage is a little ray of light in the midst of all sorts of dark things in the book of Revelation. All of these tragedies, all of these curses, all of these negative things, and yet... Even in the midst of that, verse 15 is a blessing. Blessed is the one who stays awake and is clothed, not going about naked and exposed to shame. In the Bible, clothing and nakedness are often symbols too. They usually represent preparedness or lack thereof. And preparedness for Christians in every age comes from studying God's Word as well as studying the world that God created. Preparedness comes from being a part of Christian community, from immersing ourselves in dialogue and conversation with faithful people, even or maybe especially when we disagree. And finally, preparedness for Christians comes from prayer. And in prayer, we lay down our biases, our anxieties, and our preconceived ideas at the feet of Jesus. We listen to his voice and his guidance amidst all the other noise that competes for our attention. In verse 17, when the seventh and final bowl of God's wrath is poured out, the angel says, it is done. These are hopeful words to me because they are a reminder 
that God's wrath, even God's wrath, is finite. It's limited. It's very real. But it does come to an end. And so this is my prayer for you, for me, and for all those in our world today, that in seasons of God's love, we may be thankful. In seasons of God's testing and God's trial, may we be faithful. In seasons of God's wrath, may we be prepared. And in all seasons, with Christians in all times and places, may we persevere to the end. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and God, you said when you were here on the earth that we would not know the day, the time, the hour of your second coming. I think you did that because you wanted to fill us with hope that you were always coming and yet always with us. Help us to stop looking for the hour and for the minute and the second. Help us to live the life that you have given to us. Help us to listen to your voice as you call to us and lead us. Lord, there are so many things in this world that are trying to lead us. And most of them lead us away from you. Give us ears to hear. Melt our hearts for you and for those you have called us to serve. We pray all these things just as you taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.